Welcome to the Inside Carolina podcast. I'm your host, John Siegley, coming back from the grave because Tommy Ashley is on vacation. Yes, that's right. Once a year, he gets to leave the cave that Inside Carolina keeps him in, where he records all the podcasts. Not the same cave that Jason is in, for those that are watching on YouTube. Different cave, a much less cool cave <laughs> than the original Bat Cave. But Tommy's on vacation, so... John Sigley back for this one. I'm joined by Mike Ingersoll, Buck Sanders, and Jason Staples. And I won't describe this as an emergency podcast, but this is kind of a off-the-beat podcast because for those that were paying attention to the college sports world, there was a huge decision that came down with the U.S. Supreme Court against the NCAA. We have assembled Inside Carolina's Best Legal Minds to go ahead and give you guys a quick breakdown of that Caught decision. Caught the giggle there. Caught yeah, the giggle yeah. there. J- Jason's on mute, but he's laughing. He- he's-, he's laughing. Um, but yeah, just this is going to be kind of a free throw, a free flowing podcast here to really just, you know, see what everyone thinks about this decision, what impact it might have on college sports in general. And the biggest thing is what impact could it have on UNC sports? Let's go ahead and get started here, and I'm going to start with the man himself, Buck Sanders. Buck, let's just get your initial thoughts. When the decision came down yesterday uh, by the Supreme Court, you know, what was your immediate reaction? I guess my immediate reaction was what took them so long to get to this point. Um, I think the conclusions that they reached in that decision – were conclusions that should have been reached maybe 40 years ago, somewhere in there. Um, so that was my initial reaction. And the, the thing that probably surprised me the most was that, you know, I'm not letting any cat out of the bag here. When I say we, we live in a very polarized society, a very divided society on a lot of levels. And this was a nine to nothing decision by the Supreme court. You know, you don't get uh, a decision like that very often these days out of the Supreme Court. And uh, for them to hit the NCAA over the head with it to that extent was uh, just a little bit surprising, I thought. Are you suggesting that they ran up the score on the NCAA here? I think they did. I didn't, they didn't take a knee there at the end. No, they did not. Mike, what about you, man? But let's get the opinion of the, uh, uh, the, the practicing legal guy here, especially in the civil side. Uh, it's, it's called practice because you never actually get good at it if you're in my shoes. So I'm just I'm constantly practicing my practice. But uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's a lot. Everyone talks about Kavanaugh's concurrence in this. And I'm sitting here. And I apologize. You see me looking away. If you're watching this on YouTube, I've got um, notes and some emails up and things. I've, I've done some briefing on this for folks already today once. So uh, please forgive me, but I've got the cheat sheets on my computer screen. Um, everyone talks about Kavanaugh's concurrence as uh, I've heard it described as blistering. I've, I've heard it described as forceful. I've heard it described a lot of different ways. Um, Kavanaugh's concurrence is, is interesting and that's about where it stops because that's all it's really, uh, it's utility is just that it is interesting. It's not binding law. Um, a lot of folks that don't uh, understand Supreme Court opinions may not fully grasp that. Uh, the majority opinion is what's actually binding. Kavanaugh's opinion is interesting. And what's mo- most interesting about it is not the tone or the tenor, which I don't think is nearly as aggressive or blistering as people say that it is. It's that he lays out a roadmap for the financial compensation piece of this. Um, and what he has done is he has essentially given the, the playbook to whoever wants to bring a a challenge before the Supreme Court on the financial compensation piece, which is one that the the district court, Claudia Wilkin, out in Northern District of California, uh, Judge Wilkin found that there was no violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, with respect to financial compensation. This was an educational benefits issue. Um, Both the NCAA and the plaintiffs who were uh, men's and women's, uh, current men's and women's, uh, basketball players and uh, Division One football players, they all appealed the decision. So obviously the plaintiffs appealed the decision that there was no violation on the financial side. And then the NCAA 
uh, appealed the decision on the educational side. The Ninth Circuit upheld the district court's decision in full, uh, including the injunction that enjoined the NCAA, um, which we'll get into the full scope of that, what it really means, and, and practically what, what that's going to do in the future moving forward now that it's permanent. And uh, the Supreme Court upheld the the district court's decision as well on appeal from the ninth from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. So that's where we are. Um, Kavanaugh's opinion, again, is interesting insofar as it just creates a roadmap for the financial piece, which is the one that's the sexiest. That's the one everybody wants to see. It's the one I've written about. It's the one that other folks have talked about ad nauseum for the last, like Buck said, 40, 50 years. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, this opinion isn't the avalanche victory for student athletes' rights that some folks want to believe that it is. Um, and we'll get into exactly why that is here, I think, over the next few minutes. Yeah, we definitely will. Jason, after having some time now to kind of marinate over the decision, read some of those sources like Mike was talking about, people talking about it, where are you at with this currently? Yeah, I think, Mike, what, what he just said about the roadmap is, is, I think, in a lot of ways, the most interesting thing moving forward, because this is this is one of the things that the court sometimes you see sometimes that, that the court will do is that they will make it clear in their uh, in their opinions that they are not ruling. We're not ruling this because this is not the case before us. While also saying now, if someone were <clears throat> to bring a case that, that established the following, um, we would be very interested in, in, in ruling on that. Now, of course, we can't rule on that right now because that's not the order, the, the, the order of business. That, that is very much sort of how I'm reading, reading what I see from Kavanaugh in, um, in this respect, the, uh, basically saying, yep, we, we're not, we, can't, we can't address this. We're not going to legislate this. However, um, anybody who wants to bring this case, um, you are in, you're encouraged to do so because uh, there's, there's a lot to, uh, to deal with. That's really interesting. And I think, you know, within the next few years, we're certainly going to see some folks very interested in following that roadmap. Uh, and this, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get into this later in the, in the podcast, but you know, the whole, this, this ultimately, especially as that roadmap gets, gets uh, challenged. I mean, this, you're, you're talking about, this decision doesn't do it, but it sets the roadmap for the restructuring of college sports in, 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 in many respects. And uh, the whole model on how things are done right now is going to be in flux for, for a while. And it's going to be really interesting to see how those pieces fall in place. Yeah. In the short term, Buck, what do you think we could see here? Or is there really even a short term when it comes to these type of issues? Well, uh, here's the thing that, um, is in the short term, very much in the short term. Um, July 1st, a number of um, laws, state laws, go into effect, which impact name, image, and likeness. That's July 1st. And the part of the gist of this opinion is that uh, the NCAA doesn't really have um, what it needs, which is basically antitrust, uh, shield from the you know, shield from the Sherman act that would allow it to restrict, uh, what athletes can get a name, image, and likeness. Um, I think this decision makes it pretty clear that if they were to come out and say, here are the limits you, you can make on that. Here's what, you know, what has to happen with name image and likeness. And we're going to restrict it in the following ways. Uh, there would be a race to the courthouse, uh, to file suit against any kind of regulation like that. Um, because what this decision does is going back to the, um, Oklahoma case regents, uh, Board of regents of university of Oklahoma versus NCAA. Right. Yep. Um, it, in, in that case, actually the Supreme court ruled against the NCAA, but, uh, one of the justices, um, had some language in there that said that the NCAA should have ample latitude, uh, to deal with the, um, rules of amateurism and all of that kind of stuff. 
Well, this case, uh, that we're talking about now, the Austin case completely stripped out of the way. You, you don't get ample latitude, you know, the, and basically they put them in the same basket with any other industry. And the NCA's argument in this case was incredibly bizarre to start with, which is we don't think athletes should be receiving any compensation because our consumers, the people that watch this, uh, of, from whom we make billions of dollars would like it better. If the athletes didn't get paid, that's their preference. Uh, and that was their argument. That was literally their argument, uh, in the Supreme court. And so in, in the short term, I think we're, we'll see a lot of scrambling, um, in terms of, uh, you know, there are several bills in Congress, uh, uh, dealing with all sorts of issues, uh, with college sports, including name, image, and likeness, there'll probably be a push, uh, to get one or more of those bills through. Um, there's a lot of them that are really interesting. Uh, for example, giving, in, giving the uh, college players the right to form a union or a players association like the NFL. Um, and there, there's a lot. Uh, there to unpack, which we probably won't have time to do tonight, but, uh, in the short run, what, what they're saying is like, you know, uh, in Kavanaugh's opinion, um, uh, you know, he argued, you know, with some absurd examples, but, uh, like, you know, um, uh, if you were forming a, um, uh, a bunch of dentists, uh, uh, you know, a, a dental practice and you just said, well, we're not going to pay our dentists because, uh, you know, the people that come to the, to our practice, they don't, they rather the dentist do it for love. You know, yeah, they, I'll they, go ahead and read that section. Yeah, for you, you got, you got, you got up Jason. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually, it's actually pretty good. It's, yeah. it's, it's hilarious. All of the restaurants. So he said, he starts by saying, uh, in the NCAA's business model, would be flatly illegal in almost any other industry in America. All of the restaurants in a region cannot come together to cut cooks' wages on the theory that customers prefer to eat food from low-paid cooks. Or no-paid cooks, basically. Yeah. Law firms cannot conspire to cabin lawyers' salaries in the name of providing legal services out of a love of the law. Hospitals cannot agree to cap nurses' income in order to create a purer form of helping the sick. News organizations cannot join forces to curtail pay to reporters to preserve a tradition of public-minded journalism. And movie studios cannot collude to slash benefits to camera crews to kindle a spirit of amateurism in Hollywood. Price-fixing price labor, labor is price-fixing price labor. labor. <laughs> Gotta love the, the tautology there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that uh, it's kind of hard to avoid the fact that he's, um, he's, he's, he's right about all of that. Well, he's putting uh, college athletes and college collegiate sports in the same bucket with every other industry, right? He's making no distinction there. Like the, the ample latitude piece, um, with the board of regents, uh, case, uh, when the eighties, that language is gone. You know, there's, there's no more. Yes. You get to do screwy things, uh, NCAA because we want to foster amateur you know, uh, amateur sports that that's gone. So, um, Part of the big reason, he, he, yeah, he sorry. leave a little bit of latitude for things like it's fine to require that there's students in good standing and things like this. But it, I, I think the next page was really the, the, the big point on why that ample latitude is gone is he says the bottom line is the NCAA and its member colleges are suppressing the pay of student athletes who collectively generate billions and he has that in italics of dollars and revenues for college every year, colleges every year. These enormous sums of, of money fl uh, flow to seemingly everyone except the student athletes. And ultimately, the difference between the latitude that you can give amateur sports, let's say in high school, you don't have a whole lot of push to pay high school athletes because you don't have high school sports making billions of dollars. As soon as it becomes an industry with all that money, 
now you have to acknowledge it as an industry rather than as you know something people are getting together to do for fun and that i think is really where th that kind of holds the whole piece together in a lot of ways is once you start dealing with it as an industry well then you're dealing with it as an industry right so and, that, that, and there would be no distinction there between whether we're talking about uh restricting benefits for educational purposes or restricting compensation altogether i mean the 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 rationale would be the same uh, against restrictions in name, image, and likeness as they are for educational benefits, which I'm pretty sure Mike would have loved to have had when he was at UNC because he could have had law school paid for. Uh, in uh, possibly. Fans fans didn't love me that much. I don't know how, how well my jersey would have sold. No, no, not name, uh, image, and likeness, but that, you know, in under the um, uh, at, for educational purposes, Schools can tell you, come to UNC, and if you get into law school, we'll pay for it. Oh yeah, abso absolutely, um, and and, and, and a big benefit there. Yeah, and I and I, I think especially now in the current climate, which I tell kids all the time that are coming up, is uh, you know it used to be uh, fifty years ago, you graduated from high school at eighteen, you could get a good job, you could buy a house, you know, American dream. Then it became about thirty years ago, you got to go to a four year college. So everybody started going to four year college, and if you graduate college and get a degree from undergrad somewhere, you can have a house and live the American dream. And now if you want to have any shot at making any kind of money, you got to incur a hundred thousand dollars plus in loans and get a graduate degree. And you got to have a master's bloat. in something. Yeah. There's a credential bloat. Um, but I do want to make one point. Um, the excerpt that, that Jason read uh, a few minutes ago about price fixing labor is price fixing labor. That point that just justice Kavanaugh made in his concurrence, which again, I want to emphasize is not binding here. Um, but the, that point, that excerpt that, that Jason read about law firms can't conspire to cabin lawyers' salaries in the name of providing legal services out of a love for the law, hospitals with nurses, uh, restaurants with waiters, yada, yada. Um, the reason that Kavanaugh is able to make that argument in his concurrence now and, and what gives it weight is the fact that the district court, Claudia Wilkin, again, out of the Northern District of California uh, at the trial court level, uh, she defined the relevant market, and to keep in mind, this is an antitrust suit. So the relevant market definition is, is, is vital. I mean, it's, it's, it's step one in the analysis. What is the relevant market? She defined the relevant market uh, as one in which student athletes sell their quote labor in the form of athletic services to schools in exchange for athletic scholarships and other payments permitted by the NCAA. Um, that definition was obviously upheld by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and the Supreme Court went ahead and upheld it as well. There was actually no, pu there was actually no pushback. I, I should make this clear, too. Um, there was no pushback at the Supreme Court level from either the player plaintiffs or the NCAA defendant regarding the definition of uh, how the market itself was defined. So this, this, was, this, is crit this is a critical piece, and it's nuanced in that Claudia Wilkin at the trial court level defined the the relevant market for the purpose of this antitrust analysis as a labor market, not an educational market, not the college market, a labor market. And that labor market distinction is only about a decade or so old. That's something relatively new in, in antitrust jurisprudence. So this is, this is a big deal um, that the labor market was defined or that the market was defined as a labor market specifically and not something else. It's what gave Kavanaugh the, the opening to make the argument that he made in his in his uh, concurrence, and it's really what provided the basis for the entire decision moving forward through the uh, or for the majority. Yeah, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to about a decade ago, uh, before the labor market thing was introduced, I mean, everything was basically focused on the uh, the kind of Bork model of the uh, of uh, the consumer benefit, right? For for most antitrust. Uh, as I understand it, yes, and I need to go ahead and disclaim it. I am not an antitrust lawyer by practice. I have a, I have, I have some thirty thousand foot experience in antitrust law through some of the things we've done at my firm, um, and obviously through following all these NCAA decisions and whatnot and writing on it. But uh, my understanding of it is purely academic. Um, there's, uh, there's some practical experience in it, but not enough to call myself an expert. So I don't want to be held out as that and people get mad at me if I say something wrong but yes that is my understanding Jason you know that's that never stopped me from voicing my opinion about anything you know? Yeah. you know the best advice Buck Sanders gave me about uh about being a practicing lawyer when I decided to go to law school was uh you know I, I don't need to know I think I think I, actually I think I was in law school I was studying for the bar exam Buck says you know the bar exam I never really understood I don't need to know the law I just need to know where to find it uh-huh 
And Buck, I'll tell you, I carry that line with me every single day. And I must say it at least once a week to somebody. I don't need to know the law. I just need to know where to find it. And I know where to find it. And you need to know how to reason with it. Those are the two yeah. things, right? So uh, I, I want to yeah. step back into Kavanaugh's remarks a little bit, because uh, even though, you know, when Mike's talking about it being a concurrent opinion, that means uh, nobody else joined in the concurrence. So it's basically just Kavanaugh's opinion. You know, it's one person's thinking. Other he's, people he's, agreeing, he's agreeing with the majority opinion, but he's adding his own little extra that the right. majority but, didn't want to add into their opinion. Yeah, and they didn't, uh, you know, in some cases, justices will, you know, join in a concurrence or whatever. Uh, but the language that he used is going to get quoted a lot. Uh, and it, it'll get, it, it's going to get out of that concurrence into majority opinions down the road. That's usually. Yes, it will. That, that happens. And a couple of the things that he said are just, uh, change the, the language, change the way we talk about this. When he says things like price fixing labor is price fixing labor and like almost literally before this case, we've never talked about college athletes being labor, you know, and that's how he's describing it. And, and which the, was my point with how the district court defined the market as a labor market. This is a first for student athletes. And, and then he goes on to say nowhere else in America can businesses get away with agreeing not to pay their workers. And nobody else has bothered to describe <laughs> athletes as workers before. So he's changing the, the language there. He's changing the way we're talking about this subject from, uh, you know, they, they would use, uh, and I think he even refers to it, uh, some of their labels, innocuous labels, whatever to describe, um, college athletes. And no, uh, they're not student athletes they're working you know they're labor you are earning money off of what they're doing which almost by definition means they're laboring so i think the way we're going to talk about this from now on and the way future courts will talk about it are in terms of college athletics being an industry and players being laborers and workers and, and once you get to that category, a lot of other things come into play. Um, there's going to be, somebody is going to file suit and probably already has to this point. We just haven't, uh, I'm sure that has and just got litigated kind of out of our sight, but workman's compensation laws, you know, those kinds of things come into play. Um, the, the ability to organize comes into play. Uh, a lot of those things come into play when you transfer the, your line of thought from student athlete to worker. Um, it, it's just going to change the way we talk about and think about this subject for a long, you know, forever, basically. And, and, and I, I want to observe too, that, that Kapanaw was not the only one who challenged the NCAA's language of student athlete. Cause that's really been the NCAA's big argument for, you know, for decades has been, well, they're not, you know, they're not workers, they're student athletes. You know, th this is a different class of, of things. And it was, the, the, it was adopted in response to uh, workers' compensation suits filed. I believe it was in the early eighties against uh, TCU. Yeah. Um, um, was it, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but yeah, it was uh, the uh, director of the NCAA back then adopted it as a legal defense. Yeah, I don't remember the case, but yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right, and that's yeah. where you get that language, and it's and it's it's held to now. Yes, and in the main, it's a is, it's a it's a legal fiction, is what it is. Yeah, and this this rule, not just Kavanaugh's dis, or Kavanaugh's uh, uh, opinion, uh, his uh, concurrence, <laughs> his concurrence, uh, not just Kavanaugh's concurrence, but the the main opinion here mentions and i'm gonna i'm just gonna read from the syllabus uh uh in in uh section 
B here of the of the syllabus, uh, section B.2. The language here uh, is really interesting. It says the NCAA contends the district court should have deferred to its conception of amateurism instead of impermissibly redefining its product. And here's the here's the money quote from the the summary of the of the main opinion, which is a party cannot con declare a restraint immune from uh, Article One scrutiny by relabeling it a product feature. So in other words, you can't just say, well, they're not labor or they're not workers, they're student athletes and say, well, then we're not breaking the law. It's saying, no, you can't just change the name of it and, and, and it be something different. The question is what it actually is. And that actually, I found to be a really important point in the larger opinion in that it already, in, even there is, is striking a little bit at that at what it sees as the NCAA essentially playing with definitions, uh, changing the labels on things in order to skirt the law that actually would would hold to any other industry. And, and I thought that was a, a really important point there. And again, that's something that moving forward is going to matter. Well, the very next sentence is uh, the NCAA has not even maintained a consistent definition of amateurism. I think that's that's a that's a theme that permeates through Gorsuch's opinion here over and over and over and over and over again is that they've been inconsistent with the way they even define their quote unquote product, which is amateur amateur athletics. Um, one thing I do want to mention too is there, there's been a lot we've we've spent a lot of time talking about Kavanaugh's concurrence, and that has been the focus of the media because it's the sexiest part. The financial compensation piece of this is the sexiest part of this entire debate, not just this one particular case, but of this entire debate of, um, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll call it, we'll drop it all under the umbrella of student athlete rights. Um, this opinion itself though, the, the practical application of this opinion, I think is much narrower than people, than most people seem to grasp. Um, it's certainly not sexy, which is why no one's really talking about it. Um, but I should say that this all, the district court in, instituted a permanent injunction, which obviously the U.S. Supreme Court has now upheld, so it will remain permanent, um, you know, in, in perpetuity against the NCAA. Um, I, I'll go ahead and I'll read this. Um, the injunction issued by the district court, which the U.S. Court of Appeals and Supreme Court both upheld, is now permanently in place, uh, applies only to Division I FBS football and Division I basketball for, men's, for men and women. Um, uh, a direct quote from the Ninth Circuit opinion is that uh, we consider an appeal, the appeal and cross appeal from an order enjoining the National Collegiate Athletic Association, and this is the scope of the injunction, from enforcing rules that restrict the education related benefits that its member institutions may offer students who play football, bowl, subdivision football, and division one basketball. That is the entire scope of the injunction. It applies to division one. Remember, there's Division one, division two, and division three. There's division, it, it applies to division one men's and basketball, men's and women's basketball players. And it applies to division one FBS. So not FCS, but FBS football programs. Uh, the NCAA, and then this is another nuanced distinction that everybody needs to remember here. The NCAA needs to be thought of as a trade organization. It is a separate legal entity. It is made up of its members. It is made up of its member institutions who in turn make up the member conferences who then make up the broader NCAA um, as a concept. But the actual NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association is literally a trade association. Um, it is its own separate legal entity and it operates as such. The NCAA is bound by this injunction. The opinion was, the Supreme Court opinion was clear that the injunction that was issued by the district court and upheld by the Supreme Court does not apply to colleges and universities that are members of the NCAA. The conferences and the individual member universities are free, however they see fit, to restrict educational benefits. Now, what are educational benefits in the opinion? The educational benefits that, are, that the opinion talks about are things, and they, they discuss this, are things like uh, tutoring. Uh, scholarships for graduate school, um, uh, postgraduate funding for, you know, research or what have you, um, that, that's, that sort of thing. Um, the NCAA's argument was that it feared schools would abuse their right 
to offer these uh, scholarships for graduate degrees and, and education related expenses and, and what have you education benefits, ed- educational compensation is what we're going to call it. Gorsuch's it, opinion gets pretty funny about that by the way. Yeah. Yeah. They were, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read that quote. So they, um, the NCAA was concerned that that would, uh, that would get abused. That was their argument. Why this needs to be, sh- this needs to be struck down. Um, they said that they were worried about, for example, Schools would give student athletes luxury cars to, quote, get to class and other items nominally related to education. Uh, Justice Gorsuch and the, and the majority, um, they, they flatly rejected this. The quote is, under the current decree, the NCAA is free to forbid in-kind benefits unrelated to a student's actual education. Nothing stops it from enforcing a no Lamborghini rule. And again, the district court invited the NCAA to specify and later enforce rules delineating which benefits it considers legitimately related to education. So the NCAA is restricted from putting restrictions on certain educational benefits as they relate to or as they would be provided to men's and women's Division I basketball players and FBS football players. But the NCAA is allowed under the injunction and under the Supreme Court's opinion to define what it feels are quote education educationally related benefits. So there are a lot of workarounds here, and I, and I, and the reason why I'm kind of raining on this parade is that I don't want people to think that this is this windfall victory. Um, it is a step in the right direction if you're an athlete's rights advocate. Okay, it, it is one more brick out of the wall, but the wall hasn't fallen by any measure. This is a very narrow ruling. It applies very narrowly. Um, colleges and universities and conferences are free to continue to make decisions that restrict these educational benefits on a case by case basis, depending on how, on what they feel is necessary for their, for their student population. And I do have it on good authority that at least the ACC and the big 12, and I would presume that every other conference, including all the mid majors, like the fun belt and those other conferences, conference USA, AAC, all of them have been in active discussions, both before and since this opinion, just coming out the other day on how exactly they're going to deal with this. So these are things, these are conversations that are happening behind closed doors. It is simply the trade organization NCAA that is restricted from restricting educational benefits to two discrete groups of division one athletes, the revenue tricky part, sport athletes. The tricky part there though, I would imagine is the problem of collusion once you're dealing with industry, once you're dealing with industry competition, so let's imagine. Well, so now, yeah, now, now you're getting into the per se issue with antitrust. You know, is this per se violative of the Sherman Act? Is this conduct exactly. per se violative? The fact that the Supreme Court is, and that's one thing that, you know, we're, that, that, is a, that is a nuanced, fine legal distinction that I, am, I haven't given enough analysis to. But what I will say is that my knee jerk reaction to this is the fact that the Supreme Court has uh, adopted the rule of reason analysis and has said that uh, com- they have get explicitly given conferences and universities the right to impose these restrictions tells me that they don't intend for this to be a per se violation of the Sherman Act, that it's fact-based um, and it'll be a case-by-case situation. That's what, that's my knee-jerk reaction. I could be wrong. Again, I'm not an antitrust lawyer, but that, that is my, that is my knee-jerk reaction to that. But there ask- are, there are inherent problems from the, at the conference level of the same collusive anti-competitive behavior. Well, I, absolutely. You would want, the conferences to collude on this issue, right? Uh, in in the in the sense that you don't want the SEC to say, you know what, we are going to give you that Lambo to get back and forth to class on. Some of the schools and, already might might be. And, and 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 the ACC, no, you're going to have to ride an electric bike to school. You know. Uh, well, at UNC, they're definitely giving you something electric. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ain't nobody in the ain't nobody in the SEC giving you an electric car. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, in the SEC they're driving Hummers, you know, power, power stroke, or whatever, you know. It's all uh, it's all Dodge stuff in Alabama. But you know the the, mm. the fact of the matter is, if uh, the SEC is going going to be giving students Lambos to get back and forth to class, the ACC is too. I mean, de facto, they're not going to allow. Um, above the table benefits, uh, to flow towards, uh, college basketball or college football players in the sec and the ACC says, no, we're not going to do that. You know, uh, now some conferences might like, 
the fun belt or the mountain West, they might say, well, we, we can't really afford to be handing out, you know, 105 Lambos a year. Um, so, but at the power five level, you know, I would expect the, those benefits to be even across the board, you know, th- th- so there's not any wild difference between, um, you're touching it. You're touching on recruiting discrepancies and that's one of the, right. intended, that's one of the practical issues that flows out of this. The legal, yeah. the legal issues that flow out of it are potentially more antitrust issues with, in, with the member universities quote, colluding with the conferences or if it's conference wide. So it's not an NCAA mandate. It's all the conferences working together. Like you're talking about buck. Yeah. You've got potential title nine issues. Um, you've got, you've got issues with, again, you've got two discrete athlete groups, men's and women's basketball and FBS football players. If, if under title nine, you're required to provide educational opportunities evenly across the board to all men's and women's sports. Well, what gets subsumed into educational opportunities? I would argue that the benefits do. So now you might have an issue of cutting men's sports because you've got an educational opportunity discrepancy. It's not a scholarship discrepancy, but it is an opportunity discrepancy in that if I need two violins, right? Let's, 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 let's like way oversimplify this. If I go to a class, if I go to a music class and the syllabus says you need two stringed instruments to participate in this class and North Carolina says, all right, fine. I'm going to give you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one stringed instrument. Um, or I'll give, I'll give the football bass, I'll give the, I'll give the football players and I'll give the, um, um, or let me back up here. I'm sorry. I'm confused. The NCAA comes in and says, university, member universities, you're allowed to provide two stringed instruments for this class for football players, FBS players, and men's and women's basketball players. You can do that. The university comes in and says, fine, we're going to adhere to that, but we're not going to give, um, we're not going to give the same benefits because the NCAA says we don't have to. We're not going to give the same benefit to the swimmer who's in that same class. So a football player gets two violins because he needs two violins for the music class. And nice but, ones too. Oh yeah, nice ones, Nike ones. But then the swimmer, the swimmer, jump man, if you're at Carolina, jump man violins. But the, the female swimmer, she only gets one violin. The educational opportunity now is uneven. So you've got potential Title IX issues that are, and that's a way, that's a way oversimplification. And again, I'm not a, I am not a Title IX expert either. Um, but that is, um, as I read this opinion, these are just some of the kind of off the top of my head freestyling issues that I see coming out of this. I see other antitrust issues. I see Title IX issues. Um, and like Buck said, practically from the athletic standpoint, there's recruiting problems potentially that could come out of this. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, and the Title IX issue is really, in a lot of ways, the thing that is the stickiest wicket of this whole thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember uh, a few years back, I taught a, a class, uh, a sociology of, of sport class at, at, at Duke. And we, we spent... Ooh, I teach at Duke. Go ahead. No, no don't teach. Taught. Uh, <laughs> but oh, you got I... fired? <laughs> People no, like was, us don't. People like us don't belong at Duke, Jason. I don't yeah, know. that's that, that. I think. I think. I think the uh, the bigger issue is that that was um, that was uh, you know maybe uh, a little bit too rich for my blood. But um, I can't believe any, Duke. I can't believe Duke even lets Buck live nearby. Yeah, well, go figure that. But anyway, um, when when I when I taught that class, one of the things we we spent about a week on a lot of these issues in terms of college athlete labor, in terms mm-hmm. of all of these things. And, and we ended up running, you know, we had some significant class discussions and we had somebody come in on different things. And the thing that just kept causing so many problems was, okay, we can, we can fix this. And all of a sudden there's justice and, you know, for, you know, the men's, the, the men's, the men's football players who are finally, you know, getting the, the, uh, the result of their, of their, of the work that they're putting in. Only problem is what do you do about the fact that right now, you know, football pays for softball and for every other woman, women's sport. Yeah. This is and, the, this is the not enough money argument. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have the requirement that the same, you know, the same uh, benefits be available to both, which is why you have the, you know, some of these arguments that are made. Now, the fact is when it comes to the lack of resources thing, like, Oh, we won't be able to afford X, Y, or Z. That's a fiction. I think most yeah. of us know that's, that's, that's bogus because these are accounting tricks. Yes. Make sure, you know, most, many of, many of, of those of you in the audience uh, 
have worked at companies where you get certain amounts of money on, you know, a timetable and you only get a certain amount of time to spend that money. Right. So let's say you, you get a grant for something, or, you know, there's some pool of money that you get where you have to spend $80,000 in this calendar year. And you get to the end of that year and you've only spent 60. You better find something to spend that $20,000 on because or you're you getting taxed. Or you're getting taxed. You, yeah. The next year, when you go and you ask for the $80,000 that you expect, guess what you're going to get? 60. Because that's what you actually needed. And you're yep. going to lose the 20 before. So now you lost 40. So you yep. got to find a way to. So a lot of these things where you see, oh, well, you know, all of these athletic departments are in the red. Well, they kind of have to be. They have to be. They have to show losses on the books in order for things to actually work correctly in terms of this is a not-for-profit situation this is a situation where you're not supposed to be, you're literally not supposed to be paying the people who are doing the, the work and you have to find places to actually spend the money that you have in order in, in terms of you know these buckets in order to make sure that that money actually keeps flowing and that ultimately uh, you're, you know, you, you want to show that you're either even or just slightly in the red in order to maintain the, the same flow that you have. And the tax so, treatment and the tax treatment. Yeah. And yeah. the tax treatment, again, this being not, not for profit and all of this. So all of this stuff, you know, when you, when you start to see some of those things, and then you start looking at things like, and, you know, in athletic department endowments for some of these places and all of this, you're like, look, the, the whole can't afford thing is a, is, is a red herring, especially when you could just cut the coach's salary in a lot of cases. Like, oh, wow. So you mean you don't have to pay the men's basketball coach $9 million? You can actually spread, say, $3 million of that across the student athlete population. And they Hold on a second. Good. Hold on a second, Jason. I'm not going to participate in this. If we're going to sit here and talk about the redistribution of wealth, I'm not interested in this podcast anymore. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think I think you're right. I think the coaches should should get all the money and the labor should should be for free. But the point is that that this is actually where a lot of this discussion winds up having to go as soon as you bring in Title IX and as soon as you bring yes. in this, the way that yes. these athletic departments are structured is is actually to show losses, is actually to make sure that these benefits are limited so that the benefits can be balanced across the board. And knowing that, you know, this sport pays for that sport. So we have to balance those numbers specific ways. The moment, and like you said, this is only one brick in the wall, but the moment this, you know, a few more bricks get removed from the wall, the more untenable that overall structure of how these athletic departments work is ultimately under, not only under threat, but it becomes impossible and that's when that's when things get really interesting. And, and you know, I'm not sure what things will look like in 10 years. In well, you're, you're, you're going to be dealing with decades of unchecked spending by these universities. Um, you know, and they're look at they're, the facilities. They're, My God, well, I mean, the facilities race. I mean, there, there's all of that. The, the, the endowment and we're going down a rabbit hole here. But the <laughs> the endowment argument you make is, is, is the, the number one argument that I make when people say, well, student athletes are already compensated. If we're going to talk. We're talking about the financial compensation piece. Now we moved. So the audience understands we're not talking about the opinion right now with the educational related piece. We're talking yeah. about the sexy part, the financial uh, remuneration. Inevitably we have, we move here. Yeah. Yeah. Cause this is what's interesting. The, um, the, when people say that the scholarship is adequate compensation for athletes, well, that's, I mean, okay. Um, that assumes um, that when you say that my scholarship has X value to the school and the school spends, the school spends X money on me for my scholarship, that assumes that number one, the school's actually paying for my scholarship. Most schools aren't. Um, Carolina, Rams Club, endowment. Um, one of my law professors actually put me through through college. One of my law professors and uh, and a former player um, put me, their family put me through college through their contributions to the Rams Club. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, the uh, You look at like Harvard's endowment, you look at all these universities who have endowments, which is almost all of them at this point, I believe it may actually be all of them. You know, um, all, all, running, all, all of them have endowments. It's just a matter of how big and, you know, yeah, the and joke, the, running the out running now is that Harvard is a, is a, a hedge fund with a, with an educational arm. Yeah. 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 So people that say that, you know, the school is spending X number of dollars on me. Well, again, number one, that assumes the school is actually spending the money. And number two, it assumes that there's actual loss there. So if the school is not paying for my scholarship, which it is not, um, the school doesn't pay that money then there is no loss to the school. There is only gain 
And that gain is from, again, we're now talking about definition of, of antitrust markets here, that is from labor. Now, I'm not saying my labor was a key contributor to this university, but Michael Jordan's labor was, <laughs> Julius Pepper's labor was, TJ Yates' labor was, Sam Howell's labor definitely is. You know, there's no reasonable argument against this. Um, so when you get into the value of a scholarship as adequate compensation, how? It's not that it's a loss to the school. That's a red herring. That's a quote. That's an accounting fiction. Well, it, it gets it gets even worse when you're talking about name, image, and likeness, right? Yes. Because which is the Ed O'Bannon case, by the way, also a Claudia Wilkin decision out of the Northern District of California. It, it it's uh, that's paid for by third parties. The school's not paying that at all. I mean, uh, they're giving the athlete the opportunity, you know, to earn that money. Um, with substantial uh, guardrails too, Buck. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. The guardrails there are actually pretty restrictive. I mean, like super restrictive. I don't think a lot of people quite appreciate how restrictive those guardrails are. Yeah. So, I mean, this, the school definitely is not, uh, contributing to that. And, you know, the, the thing that I find, uh, amusing in some ways is that the schools are afraid that if players can earn money from third parties, they're going to be taking away from what the schools are getting from those same third parties. You know, the, what's the point in uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, advertising on uh, you know, inside the stadium or whatever they do, we're sponsoring North Carolina when they can just, Hey, we're going to give uh, Sam Howell a million bucks and that'll be just as good, you know? So, um, but you know, you were right earlier that the decision is narrow as far as, you know, what it actually, uh, requires to happen. But when it comes to Supreme court cases, what really matters is the reasoning yes is is the logic behind it and if you, that reason and logic behind a decision and how they can reach their decision can apply in a multitude of ways i mean uh name and image and likeness Financial compensation, yeah, all of that stuff, Uni unionization, you know? which is the Northwestern case for the, you know, right, the right, right, case. right. Yeah. All of that flows from the, the, the uh, rationale, uh, that the court used and, and you just have to, you know, Xerox, you know, their, uh, how they reached their decision and apply it to another set of facts. And you're there, you know, that's, that's why it's so important. Now, one thing. Mike, I, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on this, that, that I'm, I'm puzzled on one, I was puzzled on one thing about the, um, or well, more than one, but, but one, one specific thing about the, about the decision in the main opinion, you have this, uh, this, this, uh, clause it's down, uh, it's in section C. What page are you on? Um, so I'm on page 32. Okay. Uh, where it, it mentions this bit from the uh, from the injunction, and it says, uh, uh, "So this argument rests on an overly broad reading of the injunction. District court enjoined only restrictions on yep. education-related compensation or benefits that may be available from conferences or schools. Accordingly, as the student athletes concede, uh, the injunction." And then here's the quote from the injunction does not stop the NCAA from continuing to prohibit compensation from, and then end quote, sneaker companies, yes. auto dealerships, boosters, or anyone else. Now, the interesting thing is I wonder how that actually corresponds with the name image and likeness opening now, because that, that was where I, I found myself lost saying, well, wait a second. Look, if, if you can get, if you can get things on the basis of name image and likeness, within those guardrails, then there, the door is open to compensation in a lot of ways from all sorts of, you know, anyone else as the, as the wording is here that 
together with this ruling, it's it's hard to ma- hard hard to match those two things up in a way that that restricts that. So I'm I'm curious as to what your thoughts are or were on on how those two things line up. Well, it's just a legislative fix. So the injunction applies on the facts as they exist now. There hasn't been, to my okay. knowledge, um, any name, image, and likeness legislation that's actually passed and become effective. Florida, I believe, will be the first. Uh, from what I see, they just they, they yeah, pushed off July their effective 1st. date. It's going to come back in July 1st. California was actually the first state to pass it, but it doesn't go into effect until, I believe, 2022. So Florida will actually be the first state to have uh, legislated name, image, and likeness rights for college athletes. So alleged, as of the time that this was written. Yeah, you know, that makes more sense. Or, or I guess, that, I guess that, that, that totally explains that on my end. Issued and Monday I, morning. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there is no effective legislation that would, that would override the injunction. Yeah, but the moment in there that, is effective. In that specific respect. The moment there is effective name, image, and likeness bit, then that's overridden immediately. And that does bring all that into play. So Assuming the statute itself doesn't create you know, other legal issues, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this. Oh, what hey, John, think- I forgot you were there. <laughs> no, this has been the best podcast to host because you guys have just been killing it with the, the, the takes, the thoughts, the explanations. It's, you know, I'm just sitting back sipping a, a Mai Tai at this point. John, I will but, say it's nice. Um, it's nice to have the band back together. It's been too long since we've done a podcast. I know it has. What do you guys think the next step is from the NCAA's perspective, though? We've talked a lot about, you know, athletes and uh, the lawyers, as Buck said, will be lining up, racing to the courthouse to eventually file something on behalf of the athletes, the clients. But if you're the NCAA, I mean, what what do you guys think the next step is for them? They're standing in front of the Capitol, right? They're they're up on the Hill right now, uh, lobbying for a legislative fix for an antitrust exemption in front of Congress. Um, they're not going to get it. The current climate, they're not going to get it. Um, but that that antitrust exemption they've been trying to get, they've been trying to get for years now. Um, but they are certainly not going to get it with this Congress and not after this ruling in the current social climate. I mean, uh, was it Stuart Mandel had the tweet today? It seems like dunking on the NCAA is the only is the most bipartisan thing we have going on right now <laughs> in a 9-0 decision, right? I mean, that's, he's absolutely right. So there's... Yeah. Here's my question following up, uh, lining up with John a little bit there is does this mean the end of the NCAA as a trade organization? I mean, does this pull their teeth to the extent that they no longer really serve any purpose? I've heard that argument out there, uh, people writing about that, uh, until this opinion is written for financial compensation, then the answer is the answer is no. The NCAA is still, it's a paper tiger, but it's, it's, it's wobbling, but it's not on its last legs. And the NCAA will never cease to exist. There are too many benefits just from a pure negotiation standpoint. I think the March, the March madness CBS deal you know, billion dollars or whatever it is a year for them. Just from, just as a representing us as member schools and conferences at the negotiation table thing, they have value to these, to these schools and to these conferences. So the NCAA will just reinvent itself. But until this certainly, this opinion doesn't help them, but it doesn't end them as a, you know, kind of a nuclear option. What will ultimately be the death knell will be the Kavanaugh roadmap is used and there is a financial compensation decision adverse to the NCAA from the Supreme court at some point in the near future, the fa- you know, we're going to need the right set of facts. We just don't have those here. Um, but the right set of facts does exist. It will happen one day. And this yeah, is no- like, we've been talking about, this is a step in that direction, a big step though. It is a narrow holding, but Buck's right. The reasoning is a big step in that direction. Yeah. I think, uh, what you said about the NCAA not going anywhere, you know, they're not going to go away. They'll, they'll reinvent themselves and they've reinvented themselves more than once in the past. Well, like Gorsuch says, they haven't even had a consistent definition of amateurism. <laughs> right, <laughs> they're constantly exactly. changing themselves to, to keep themselves relevant and to survive. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's, as long as there's, go, uh, there's college sports, there will be a national collegiate athletic association. 
there's going to be an association that, you know, manages competitions. Yeah. And they provide that, benefits that, and that, go ahead and rattle them off. I mean, it sets the rule sets standardized rules across the sport that, yeah. you know, establishes uh, championships that, uh, you know, like you said, negotiation, all sorts of, you know, in arbitration between different uh, institute member institutions yeah. that, you know, have issues in terms of, uh, com- you know, matters of competition or re- health, you know, re- health and safety protocols. The reason Teddy Roosevelt commissioned what became the NCAA in the first place back in when was it 1905? Yeah. So a, a lot of these things are going to still be there. And honestly, the other thing that, that people forget is the compensation piece doesn't actually hurt the NCAA all that much because the NCAA isn't going to be paying those bills for the most part. Now, if they say that, that the NCAA has to say compensate and I imagine that this ruling is going to come forward at some point, something along these lines or some legislation. The NCAA generally doesn't make a lot of money. I mean, most of the NCAA's money comes straight out of the percentage cut that it takes from March Madness. The which rest is a of ton the, of money. Which is a lot of money. But the majority of the money that that is out there that, you know, you see the billions of dollars that are going into college sports. Spread around the, the conferences and the schools. That's right. The NCAA is not bringing in that money by and large. It's the, co- it's the universities and the schools themselves that are actually making that money. And that's where those changes ultimately are, are going to have to be. It, it, you know, it, the NCAA is not, yes, it's benefiting indirectly you know, as, a, as, a, as a trade organization from the labor that's not being directly paid you know, in, in, in some of these things. But it's the schools and, 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 the, uh, and the conferences that are actually bringing in that money and then would have to find new ways of distributing that money that all of a sudden, you know, that changes their business model. For the NCAA, a lot of that stuff, basically, they just go, okay, well, shrug. Well, here's, here's going to be the new rules for how, how we're going to do this and trying to maintain competitive balance at the various levels that are set. And here's the rules. And all right, you know, hand these to the members, member schools, and that's how this is going to work. I don't think that really challenges the NCAA that much. It's just changing the way that they do business instead of the fact that they do business. Well, I, I would uh, say that there's one caveat to that uh, out there, which is if you look at the, the language that Kavanaugh is using and, and some of the other language in the opinion, and they speak of um, college at major college of athletics. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about football and basketball. They're not talking about swimming, um, that the way they're talking about it being making billions of dollars and it's an industry and these are workers, um, uh, a player's association could come along and take the place of about 90% of what the NCAA does player safety. Uh, you know, all of those kinds of things can be a negotiation between the players and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, schools, conferences, what have you. Um, so I, I think that's the wild card down the road, uh, that if there was a, uh, players association and, if you'll remember back to uh, the whole uh, Pac-12, we want to play Big Ten. We want to play with Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence. You know, we want to play this year. Uh, that whole movement that got started and they put out a petition and stuff. I think there is some sentiment out there uh, among college athletes to want to organize so that they can actually have a say in what's going on. Um, I I don't think it's enough for them, for the NCAA to lose some power over them as as it would be for them to gain some power and and to have a seat at the table and to be able to express what they want, Uh, which I don't think this opinion really does much about that. I mean, it, it actually doesn't do anything in terms of giving the players a voice, right? Nothing. I mean, yeah. Um, and, and I think there's some sentiment out there for that, where it goes, who knows it could be, um, you know, a dozen years down the road before anything like that happens. But 
you know, I can see because of the way this language plays out, talking about the industry and workers and price fixing and labor and all of that, that the the door is open, uh, a crack. Well, there for, was a, there, there was a case that there was an NLR, NLRB, a national labor relations board case, uh, several years ago. Um, they said a graduate students at Columbia university, um, sought employment status and that decision, I won't get into a whole rundown of that case. I've, if you Google my name and uh, I've got a few things written on it out on the interwebs, but um, that Columbia university NLRB decision is what leaves the door open a crack. It's actual language that I use buck. Thank you very much. Um, it, it actually leaves the door open a crack for the unionization thing. I see Jason typing Jason. It's uh, the title is student athletes as employees, Northwestern Columbia and unionization. I'm already reading it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, 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 that decision is what we're talking. When we talk about unionization, all the benefits that Buck has, has mentioned here, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a seat at the table. Um, that the Northwestern decision obviously was a hit to that. Um, but that Columbia decision, which is unrelated to athletics, the reasoning there, like Buck was talking about earlier, the reasoning there is what leaves the door open a little bit for that to still potentially be, um, an avenue of pursuit for athletes in the future. And Buck's right. It would supplant a lot of the uh, utility of the NCAA at this point. If players can just do it themselves, we don't really need an oversight committee. We will for certain things, but yeah, at, any, at a certain level though, it's easier sometimes to, once you have a seat at the table to negotiate with a, with the trade organization or, you know, there's a reason that in the NFL, for example, you have the players organization, negotiating with the NFL as opposed to, to you know, each conference or division or what, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So there's a point at which, you know, the, those negotiations work that way where there's a seat at the table and there's negotiation between the players representatives and then uh, the over, you know, whatever body is over the, the largest group that those players are included in. So, I mean, I still think that that would most likely involve, some version of what, what would still probably at that point be called the NCAA, but again, very different. And I do think actually that the players missed an opportunity with all the COVID stuff to really push on some of the organization stuff. I mean, you saw some of those things really developing at that time. Uh, there, there was more of a push to that, more of a move in that direction publicly uh, than, we, than we had seen, at least since I'd say the Northwestern situation. Uh, you know, you had some of the statements from Trevor Lawrence and, and some others that were really, you know, pushing potentially in the direction of a of a uh, of a players union. And then, it, as usual, it fizzled. And I think one of the things that stands in the way of that is unlike in the NFL, in the NFL, you have, first of all, the, the, the they're already making money and you have, you know, the uh, you, you have fewer obstacles in the way of of establishing uh labor relations to begin with but the the bigger problem is a lot of you know college athletes are only going to be college athletes for what five years at you know generally at most unless you've got a, a really bad injury and so you know you get an 18 year old a 19 year old and it's really hard to organize 18 and 19 year olds and by the time they're 20 21 22 and they're really ready to start like they're starting to get fed up with like look at my schedule look at what i'm doing and i'm looking around and you know ultimately i'm talking to people around we should all be organizing by the time they're they're organizing they're already finishing their careers and then moving on and I think that's actually one of the obstacles. I mean, Trevor Lawrence talked about all this and, you know, became a face of it. And guess what? He's now in the NFL. And this is one of the, I think, one of the obstacles that we're going to see. And I think ultimately we're going to end up seeing cases brought by former players that are probably going to be the stuff that, that ends up breaking through with some current players sign you know basically uh worked in as a uh as as a part of that but it'll be interesting well that's that's what the i mean that's what that's what the plaintiff group was here yeah in this austin case it was former and some current yeah which is i think the only way you're gonna have to do it you're gonna have to get some you're gonna have to get former players there's a maturity there the maturity issue is what you're touching on there's a yeah, there's a maturity get, issue you're gonna that. have to get former players that are interested enough and still and have enough uh 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 focus on this to, to well, really got, push forward and then and enough and life experience and enough life experience to understand the issues too yep yep 
without glazing over when you're telling, you tell an 18 year old about sit there and lecture him on, on labor issues, he's going to glaze over and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you tell, you tell most full grown adults, you know, you tell a 40 year old about labor issues is probably going to glaze over and go to sleep. Yeah. 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 So there, there is a, uh, there is certain, and that's what I mean by maturity. I don't mean immature, like, you know, picking boogers and shoving them on the wall. I mean, like immaturity in terms of. Oh, thanks for that graphic image. <laughs> Yeah, I was sorry, but, <laughs> but why is Buck so offended by that? <laughs> Let's go ahead and start wrapping this one up a little bit, guys. We've been going on for probably about an hour now, maybe a little bit past. <laughs> what about the impact this could have specifically from a UNC perspective? What do you think, Buck? Is that a little bit too narrow? Or, I mean, as, as Carolina fans, should people be looking for anything specific out of this decision or of – in, in anything that's going to, going to follow it? Now, I don't think there's anything UNC specific about this uh, decision. It is going to change the landscape is what it's going to do. And obviously uh, UNC administrators, uh, you know, people in the athletic administration and so on and so forth, Bubba Cunningham, uh, they're going to have to adapt to a different landscape. I mean, this is not, uh, the NCAA's purview is not the same today as it was a week ago. And, and you, when that happens, you have to adapt to it. That's, uh, as far as anything in particular that affects, uh, UNC, uh, UNC does have a lot of, uh, Olympic sports. Um, I guess there's 24 teams, um, at UNC of all kinds of variety, um, which is more than the normal, uh, school has what is I it, just, us, us, Michigan, Stanford, and Texas. Is that the top four? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I, I noticed that Clemson just added two non, uh, you know, major revenue sports, two Olympic sports in the last week, I think women's lacrosse and something else. I forget. Uh, but they've they just were, added they two teams. I think they were short on the, um, on the title nine progress thing. So they needed to add some, they added two, which was, uh, kind of took me by surprise because they tried it, cutting track. You remember that they tried cutting track and blaming COVID that goes back to our, you know, finance, finance wizard, wizardry, right. Accounting yeah. wizardry. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think there's anything specific to UNC out of this, except that everybody, every school, including UNC is going to have to, you know, get their bearings from this because, you know, the landmarks aren't the same. Everything looks different. You just got to figure out your way around now in a, in a new landscape. Well, UNC has got a decision to make. I mean, the opinion explicitly says the injunction only I'm reading on top of page 32 for those of you who are following along in your textbooks. Um, <laughs> it's the injunction applies only to the NCAA and multi-conference agreements. Individual conferences remain free to reimpose every single enjoined restraint tomorrow or more restrictive ones still. So the school has a decision to make. The ACC, the university can do whatever they want under this opinion. But from a business perspective, what's the smart thing to do? From a student athlete relations perspective, What's the right thing to do? What are you going to do that's going to impact recruiting? You're going to screw your athletes because school down the street's not going to do that. Again, getting back to the point Buck made earlier about Lamborghinis. The recruiting landscape is the free market here that will restabilize um, the decisions that these schools make, even though they've been even though they've been given carte blanche to do and restrict whatever they want from an educational benefits standpoint. Are they going to? I think that's going to be the interesting question, which ones will and which ones won't. And let's not pretend that recruiting is, an, is a level playing field either. I mean, this is another thing that it's another one of those fictions that you have like, well, you know, we have to preserve the, you know, the, the, the equal recruiting. Be Come on like that. First of all, just look at the at, as we brought up earlier, the facilities where all this money gets poured into facilities precisely because you can't compete above, at least above <laughs> above the table on other grounds. So you better make sure that you have the nicest waterfall in your training facility 
and you know the the, the cool slide in your football only facility or whatever <laughs> is gonna you know your mini golf or whatever is gonna is gonna potentially attract more recruits to your place to show hey look you can see how seriously we take you know our family mm-hmm. here and you want to sign on to our family instead of their family where clearly you know you're just kind of living you know in a van down by the river up there you know that sort of thing is how do we get back on the right track <laughs> you know that's the that's the sort of thing this is not a level playing field already and so, you know, this is, that's going to be another interesting thing as, as we move forward to see how that, how that works out. But you're absolutely right that as these schools recognize that, wait a second, you mean to tell me that I can promise my athletes that if they get into graduate school afterwards, we'll pay for that? Absolutely. That that's a, a very explicit part of the, of the decision that they can promise current players future scholarships in graduate school. That so, becomes a really, really attractive kind of thing that, you know, it's hard to imagine that certain conferences or schools wouldn't look very seriously at that sort of thing. And, and I'm, I'm interested to see where some of that goes in response to this. I will well, tell you, sorry, John, I'll just shameless plug here, not for myself, but for somebody I very much respect um, for anybody who's really interested in these issues and is on campus, either as a student, as a professor um, graduate student, or even just nearby, and you have the opportunity to either take a class with or just meet up with and speak to uh, Professor Barbara Osborne. She's a, one of our mm. professors over at the law school. Um, she is also, she doubles as the head of the sport administration department, which our sport administration program is the premier sport administration program in the country, and she's been heading it since its inception. Um, uh, Professor Osborne is, ex- is extremely well-regarded in the amateur sports industry um, and in the amateur sports field. She was a practicing sport law attorney for many, many years. And from the university standpoint, um, nobody that I've ever met understands these issues from the university standpoint better than her. Um, We disagree on a lot of things, but we also agree on a lot of things. And she was one of the best educators I ever had. And I'd be lying to you if I sat here and pretended that all of these ideas that I have swirling in my head about this opinion that came out on Monday came, came only from me and from my, uh, from my brain. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak with her and she is tuned into all these things and is a, is a wonderful resource for anybody who's interested in these issues. Please, if you have the chance, take, her, take classes with her, get coffee with her, stop by her office, speak with her. She's, she's outstanding. And uh, I hope she you know, listens to this and isn't too disappointed in a lot of my takes on it. Um, I'm sure I've said some things wrong that I'll be getting a text message about at some point this week, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, anybody has a chance to meet with or, or hang out with or take a class with Barbara Osborne, please take advantage of that. Yeah. All I was going to say earlier is that when, when you're talking about grad school, that's one area where I think Carolina could be well positioned because I mean, UNC has some of the best grad schools in the entire country. Amen. Um, and- that's indisputable. Yes. <laughs> no yeah. doubt. So, I mean, it's just going to be a a very interesting future here for college sports in general. I think we've about hit all the major things. Was there anything else, guys, that you wanted to bring up before we go ahead and call this one to a close? Well, I was just going to say that if uh, if any of us said anything wrong or if I said anything wrong and anybody has any complaints on this, just make sure you contact Mike and let him know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And if I and, and nothing I said was legal advice, I need to, our, our firm general counsel would appreciate me saying this. Nothing that I've said tonight should be taken as legal advice. Uh, these are not legal opinions. They are my personal opinions and interpretations <laughs> of a publicly available document. Thank you very much. You know, just, j- just send all the hate mail to Tom. Tommy Ashley on <laughs> social media. He, he loves that. Yeah, there you go. All right, you guys. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up then. I appreciate all of y'all being here tonight to get this one done. And um, hopefully we'll be talking again soon. And we'll have to see when the next landmark Supreme Court case comes out. And we'll do this again. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody.